don't be fooled and think that your current old dusty savings account at that same bank, Corey, is automatically going to be increased to the newer rate because these banks aren't doing that, which I am appalled by, like I mentioned. Welcome to Upticks with Jake Falcon, founder and CEO of Falcon Wealth Advisors. In this podcast, we help high net worth individuals overcome financial complexities. We do this by enhancing financial literacy and discussing topics in a language free from industry jargon. Join us as we help explain exactly what having a solid financial plan means as Jake draws from years of experience in helping hundreds of individuals get financially organized and focused on their goals. We hope you find Uptix educational, entertaining, and shareable. Now, on to the show. Welcome back to Uptix with Jake and Corey. Corey, welcome back to the show. Jake, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. And I'm happy to report I did return safely from golf in the desert. How'd it go? You know, I I don't think I'm built for these guys' trips, Corey. I had a good time. I mean, I had a good time relative maybe to a bad time. Like, it wasn't the best time in my life. It probably wasn't the worst time in my life. I just really like my wife. <laughs> so, did you hear that rachel that's you right can rewind, you, can, you can go back 15 seconds and listen to it again so four days of golf for me is too much also in a row i would have been happy to leave after maybe two i did play really well out of the gate and then as i was there my rounds progressively got worse really beautiful golf courses i do prefer though trees to desert i hit my ball on the desert a lot Corey. i didn't like that i <laughs> yeah, found it I, a lot which was weird, which What's that? You know, I found my ball a lot. So I hid it in the desert and then we would go and find it. It's kind of weird. You think People you would be on a golf course in the desert. We're not finding those balls. Well, cause like there's cactus and bushes and, and I would still find it weirdly. So anyways, I had, a, you know, again, it was a good trip. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I got to play some cool golf courses. So, but I won't be doing that probably for a while. I, I'm a much more, again, one or two rounds and I'm good. Yeah, which makes sense. But now you've cracked the door open for the 2024 golf season, right? That's right. That's right. I kicked it off and we're off and running. So we're good. It's good to be back and it's good to be recording upticks. Quick, before we get into the headlines, Corey, I do want to, again, promote my book that's coming out here, hopefully mid to late spring called Retiring Right, Smart Steps for Exiting Corporate America. We are in the process of getting the layout put together. So I'm real excited about that. For all of our listeners and our audience for Upticks, I'll be sure to let you know how you can get your copy. And also, thank you to all of our subscribers and listeners. We continue to grow that count, so please give us a thumbs up, like, and share our content. The whole purpose, Corey, of Upticks is to enhance financial literacy, and we're looking to do that at scale by recording these episodes out there. So thank you again, like I said, for everybody tuning in. Corey, you got anything before we kick off the headlines? Just a quick question for you, uh, for myself, Jake, or for anybody who's watching or listening to the show, if they want to follow the updates or follow along with the book, Retiring Right, as it's published, is the best way to do that just to subscribe to this show? Is there somewhere else that people should subscribe to if they want to follow along with the book? Yeah, great question, Corey, and thank you for asking. So literally, if you go to our website, falconwealthadvisors.com, Luke, our communications manager, has put in a little contact form that you could put your name and email address in there. It's under the retiring rights section, and then that way you will get updates on the book. Certainly, if you're a subscriber to our weekly Upticks newsletter, that will also get you updates as well. And simply, if you want to subscribe, just email Luke at falconwealthadvisors.com, and Luke will make sure you're on the list. Also, Corey, good point. If you have a question or a topic that you'd like Corey or myself to discuss here live on Upticks, feel free to send that over to Luke, and he'll make sure we get it. Again, that's Luke at FalconWealthAdvisors.com. All right, right. Corey, why don't we play ball? (laughs) Let's jump into the headlines. Why don't you get us kicked? Why don't you get us kicked off here, Jake, when high yield savings accounts come with an asterisk? Right. So these have been all the rage here lately, Corey, Mm -hmm. that you can earn more than 0% in your savings account, believe it or not. Now, What I found appalling, Corey, when I read this article is that some of these big banks that are advertising three, four, five percent interest on savings accounts, Corey, I don't know if you knew this, but they're only typically for some of these banks for new accounts. Yep. So if you have a quote unquote high yield savings account at XYZ Bank, 
Maybe it was paying you 1% for the last five years or whatever. And now they're advertising that their savings accounts are paying 3%. Don't be fooled and think that your current old dusty savings account at that same bank, Corey, is automatically going to be increased to the newer rate because these banks aren't doing that, which I am appalled by, like I mentioned. So they what they'll do, Corey, is they'll they'll create a new type of savings account. So you might be in the high yield savings account, yeah. then they open a premier savings account or a select savings account or a platinum savings account. Some of these banks, Corey, will literally open many, many, many different types and running different marketing campaigns to get people to deposit their money, but they're not paying their old customers the higher rate. You heard this? Right. Yes, I have. Yeah, there's a number of banks. I, well, there is an article, I don't remember the bank, it's escaping me at the moment, but recently where I read just about this, where consumers, customers, people that had their money in the bank were like, wait a minute, this rate's what's being advertised, but this is what I'm getting paid. And the distinction between the two account types is one word, right? Where there's, like you said, select your premier. So you need to be, so the takeaway here though, Corey, is you need yes. to be vigilant. So, and, and I did this personally, right? My bank, my local bank, in Kansas City is only paying me a quarter of a point or a quarter of a percent on my checking account. So I went out there and another quick plug, we've got a relationship with Goldman Sachs where they have a high yield savings account that's paying over 5% currently as of the recording of the show. Now that could change, that could fluctuate. But what I did, Corey, is I just transferred some money from my checking into this high yield savings account. I'm earning more than 5% interest. I can move it back if I need it and so forth. It's all digital, it's all online, pretty easy to set up. So again, if any of our clients at Falcon Wealth Advisors are not getting over three, four, five percent on their cash, let us know. Email service at falconwealthadvisors.com and we should have a conversation. The problem though, Corey, is you've got to be vigilant. You've got to investigate and see what interest yep. is your bank paying you. And that's what you got to figure out. And you got to stay on top of that because it can change, right? So good lesson here. Good takeaway. It's still kind of messed up that these banks, I get it. I get it. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I know why they're doing it. But again, you've got to be vigilant as a consumer. You got to make sure that your cash is earning interest. And one other point, Corey, before we move on, mm -hmm. is that this is not an investment strategy. So I don't want people taking money out of the stock market and putting it in there. So this is for money you don't want to invest. That's what this should be for. You're, we're talking about your emergency fund. Maybe you're going to buy a house in six months and you're sitting on some cash. Maybe you're going to buy a car, whatever. This is what this is for, money you don't want in stocks and bonds. Good. Anything else? No, I'm glad you shined a light on it because it is, uh, it, it's disappointing but not surprising. I guess that's the way that I feel about it in terms of the way that uh, banks are treating it, that for new customers. So it's ultimately the power. We have the power uh, to make sure that we're in the right place. And everybody watching and listening to the show has the same. And we're, exactly. We're exactly. Very good. All right, Corey, let's go to the next one. Making money on I bonds was easy. The tax paperwork isn't. The last few years, I bonds were all the rage. We've talked about it some on this show, Jake, with inflation and CPI much higher, people could earn a lot more interest on these I bonds. Now, as, there, as folks may or may not know, if you owned I bonds, they're purchased through Treasury Direct. But what I wanted to point out on this show is that a 1099 form, so the tax form that would get filed with the rest of your tax forms, will not be mailed to you according directly to Treasury Direct. So they're not going to mail you a 1099 for money that you made on your I-bonds. And for I-bonds, you actually have to log into the website, navigate to the page where you can download the form, and you ultimately will have to, there's not a print button, so you need to save it as a PDF, and then you can print it, or you can save it as a PDF along with the rest of your tax documents. But the big point here is, if you owned I-bonds the last few years, if you redeemed them, make sure that you have captured the appropriate 1099s when you file your tax return. And don't expect the Treasury Direct to mail them to you because they've flat out said they're not going to do that. Yeah, that's good, Corey. And yeah, and especially when you're investing directly with the government, I got to believe that if you don't pay taxes on that interest, they're going to come find you for it. Yeah, so, yeah that's easy for them to find. Yeah, because they already have the money. So the best, a good quick tip on this, Corey, is the best mm -hmm. way to make sure you have all of your 1099s ready to go is to go through your financial plan with your financial planner here at Falcon Wealth Advisors, where we will list out every single asset. So we'll talk about your IRA, your brokerage account, your I bonds, your high yield savings account, whatever that may be. Yeah. And then go through that and use that as a checklist 
to say, all right, do I have a 1099 for this? Do I have a 1099 for this? And, and so forth. That way you're not going to your accountant or filing your yourself unprepared. So that's, that's a good use of a financial plan to make sure that you have all of the appropriate 1099s and be careful because not all accounts will issue one either. So again, lean on your team here at Falcon Wealth Advisors. We can help yep. walk you through if you're expected to get one, but I'm glad you shared that tip today that the I bonds 1099s, you still have to potentially pay taxes on some of that interest. So again, you're going to have to go out there and pull that yourself. They're not going to just sit back and send it to you. Yep. All right. All right. Great. Let's go on to the next one, Corey. Jake, what does it mean to be a financial nudist? <laughs> yeah. How about this one, Corey? So uh, I don't know. Do you, uh, do you know who Jack Howe is? Jack Powell? Howe. H-O-U-G-H. Uh, yes, I do, actually. Did he used to write for Barron's? Yeah, he still does. Yeah. So yeah, he's a writer for Barron's. He also has a podcast out there, which mm -hmm. I typically try to listen to, comes out once a week. And he went on a rant, Corey, in his latest podcast. And I think he even wrote a little bit about it in, in an article about that he personally, now again, this guy's not a financial advisor. So in full disclosure here, nothing on this show is advice. I just thought it was a very clean takeaway that to him, being a financial nudist means he's in stocks and bonds. And he's not in all of the invested in all of these esoteric investments, hedge funds, private equity. He doesn't even like REITs, Corey, tre uh, tips or tr uh, treasury inf inflation protection securities or whatever. So mm -hmm. he is just his idea is keep it very simple, keep the fees down, keep it transparent, and you can make a good return doing that. And so I just thought that that was a good takeaway for our audience is that like, don't get caught up in cryptocurrency or collectibles or NFTs or all this stuff, these meme stocks, all this stuff that bubbles up and ultimately bursts. You can do really well owning stocks and bonds, right? You don't have to go out there and get into crypto, for example, right? Or you don't have to go out there and find some weird closed end fund, hedge fund, fund of funds, all that stuff, Corey. Because all that stuff typically does is it's manufactured products by Wall Street that layers on fees and complexity, and it's sexy. So people want to be able to go to their cocktail party or their dinner party and say, hey, I'm in Corey Bittner Hedge Fund, right? And it, he only takes 20 clients a year and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm just saying that, Corey, you don't have a hedge fund. But I don't. you know what I mean, right? So what are, you, what are your thoughts on being a financial nudist? It's good. That is a clean takeaway from Jack because it is something that we have conversations with clients all the time. And we talk about, uh, you know, shiny object investing. And it doesn't mean, you know, my, my intent is not to say that none of that should ever be evaluated or considered. It's just the fact that a lot of people, most people, I would venture to say, at least the clients that we work with, Jake, who are close to retirement or already in retirement, just don't need to own all of those different types of investment products to ultimately achieve the returns that they need to, to make their financial plan work. So when we are evaluating the investment landscape, I feel like it really all needs to narrow down to what do I need to do? What do my returns need to look like in order for my financial plan to work? And then how do I achieve those returns? Does that require me to buy cryptocurrency or to speculate on a private credit fund or whatever it might be? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but more often than not, I don't think that's the the process that people go through when making those decisions or considering those types of investments. Yeah, it's all fear and greed, right? That, that people will go buy gold bars because they're scared or they'll buy crypto because they're greedy. So I think again, though, Corey, you mentioned not for a, a retired, but I also argue it's not for a younger investor either. However, whether you're young or older, if you want to speculate and get burned and lose money, as long as you're not doing it by disrupting your financial plan, I'm okay with, I would almost argue for a younger investor, it's better to get burned early on in your career or your savings history so that you do understand, oh my gosh, I don't need to be doing these weird things. I just need to be buying stocks and bonds and letting compound interest do its thing. And so I think it can be useful only from a perspective of learning a lesson. Now, the big risk in this though, is Corey, is what if somebody buys crypto and they double their money and now they have this false confidence that they think they know what they're doing. And then they go put all of their chips or all of their retirement in crypto. So you got to be careful. The idea is if you can't explain it in great detail and you don't understand all of the fees, the liquidity, the risks, then really should you be investing in it? Really? Right. Let's, let's be adults here. Really? Should you be doing that? 
And second, you know, don't get caught up in these fads. They're, they're just, you know, that's what they are. These fads come and go. There'll be another one. There'll be another one. There'll be another one. So let's keep things simple. Let's hit singles and doubles. And let's let compounding do its thing. Really good. I like Financial it. Financial nudist. How about that? How about it? All right, Corey. The Trump versus Biden economy. A comparison in 10 charts, which please save us. We're not going to have 10 charts. I will spare you and anybody watching or listening to the show from sharing any of the charts, Jake. But what I do want to talk about here briefly is some of the data, uh, because okay. that's, really the, that's really the big point here. And there's a lot of there's a lot of content. Now, hold on. Hold on. Time out. Time out. Hold on. Was this from the challenge last week or are we going to get to that? We're getting there. OK, go ahead. I do have a chart for you there. All right. Fair enough. Go ahead. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, we're going to get there. This particular article, though, was really there's a lot of content there. But what I wanted to boil down is just point out some of these takeaways and see if you had any thoughts around this, Jake. Uh, so the Trump versus Biden economy, there's a number of different comparisons that were made here. But what I found what I thought the key takeaways were is that there's been positive inflation adjusted GDP growth for both presidents during the first three years of their terms, both President Biden and Trump. There's been positive stock market returns for both presidents in their first three years, looking at the S&P 500 for both Joe Biden and Donald Trump. There's been low unemployment during both presidencies. There's been rising public debt during both presidencies. And the main takeaway from my perspective is that an election in November of 2024 is not a reason on its own to change your investment strategy. And even if we knew what the outcome of the election was going to be, it does not mean that we have any idea how the market's going to respond to it. And that's really what I wanted to share from this, Jake. But I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. I love that, Corey. That's, that's bravo. If I had my applause button working, I would be hitting it right now. Luke, we'll maybe you could throw some applause for Corey. So I, have, I, have to give, I can't take credit for this statement. I've been using it a lot, though, Corey. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I've even said it on the show yet, but this, a client told me this, and I love it. He or she said, I don't even remember who said this. It's been a while. Said that Biden should be in a home and Trump should be in jail. <laughs> have I told you that one yet? No, I don't think you have. I've been using that a lot. But to your point, also the economy, the markets, whatever, have fared quite similarly during both of these regimes. And so I love your last statement. The president should not blow up your investment strategy. We've had good presidents. We've had bad presidents. And the market persists. We want to make sure that we are invested in areas that we think will benefit from current government legislation or whatever that may be, and we'll certainly pivot and adjust accordingly. But because you hate Trump or love Trump doesn't mean you should buy or sell stocks. Same thing with Biden, because you hate the guy or love the guy shouldn't mean you buy, buy or sell stocks. You want to stay diversified, right? You want to have pro-Biden and pro-Trump stocks in your portfolio. And that's okay, right? Because you can't predict the future. And regardless of anyone says, Corey, you're right, they, they can't really argue that Biden's been worse for the economy than Trump and vice versa. So let's stop using that. And if you just don't like somebody's policy or politics, that's one thing. But don't let that drive your investment decisions. Bravo. I'm glad, again, you shared that. Thank you. All so right, does Jake. that mean we don't need to talk about the election the rest of the year? <laughs> you don't have to twist my arm, but I feel like we're <laughs> going to be talking about it some more. I'm sure we're going to be talking about it some more. But good. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you shared that data with us. All right. Let's move on to the next one. All right, Jake. Upsize or downsize, how to choose a forever home that actually fits you. Yeah, so you hear this a lot, Corey, for retirees and pre-retirees mm -hmm. is that they want to, you know, they're empty nesters. They want to downsize their home. They want to shrink their footprint. They don't need as much house. What's fascinating about this article is that they argue that some retirees, Corey, actually opt for a bigger home. And perhaps they're getting a bigger home because maybe they've got a, a home office because they still do some consulting or, or some sort of work. Maybe they've converted a bedroom into a home mm. gym so now they, they can work out. Or maybe they just want a bigger lot because they don't want to feel squeezed in a townhome, for example. And so there were some good takeaways that I made notes on here is that it's okay to have a larger home in retirement. And I want to hear your, your thoughts from your client meetings after I go share these takeaways. But the main pieces here is to consider... If you can afford to maintain it, right? You certainly don't want to shrink your nest egg because you bought this mansion. And if you want to maintain it, right? More bedrooms means more to clean. Bigger yard means more to mow or pay somebody to mow. And I thought this was also interesting, Corey. The location might not be as important as the function. 
Yes, you obviously want to live in a safe neighborhood or maybe close to your kids or grandkids, whatever that is important to you. But they argue that it's not always location, location. If you can find a house that meets all your needs and is functional, that's okay. Because think about it. You don't have to be close to your job if you're not going to work. So, but my question to you, Corey, is do you have any clients that have upsized in retirement? I'm sure that I do, but there's none that are jumping out to me, Jake, off the top of my head. I have actually, maybe it's because I read this article. I have clients that have actually gotten bigger or nicer homes in mm-hmm. retirement because that's, because that's what they wanted to do. And that, you know, think about it. If you're, if you're kind of a homebody like me, right? I, I just talked about, it. I didn't really love traveling to Arizona in retirement, having a nice big home, as long as I could afford it and maintain it, wouldn't be such a bad thing, right? At least for a little while. Now, Maybe early in retirement, in your go-go years, you get because maybe you want to maybe you want to entertain, maybe you want to have parties and celebrate birthdays and the holidays at your house, and maybe that requires a little bit nicer, bigger place. And then maybe in your seventies, eighties, nineties, then maybe you shrink that footprint. So it's okay to to go bigger and then maybe shrink it one more time. So I just want to challenge people to don't don't see retirement as I think there's a, a negative connotation with that, Corey. That Oh, you got to retire. Then you got to go live in an apartment. Then you got to give up your driver's license. And, you know, I don't want people to feel that way. And it doesn't have to be that way. You know, obviously you want to make sure that you can afford it, but that doesn't mean you necessarily have to go move back in with your kids or go, go get an apartment just because you're retired. It's not necessarily the case. So I thought it was good to, to open people's eyes to that a little bit. Yeah. And real quick, I just want to add to that, Jake, while, while you were talking, I was also thinking about it. I stand corrected. I thought of a client while we're while we're having this conversation, Jake, that built a larger, brand new home in retirement on their farm in Iowa, and that was a specific goal that it's been mapped out in the financial plan for many years. And I think you know my my big takeaway from what you just explained, Jake, is that uh, you know the what the path of retirement looks like is going to be different for different people. A right. lot of our clients were planning for a, you know thirty plus year retirement, uh, hopefully, and you know for those reasons. It, it doesn't just need to be a foregone conclusion that you should downsize in retirement because that's what people do. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect example. That's good. All right. Let's go on to the next one here, Corey. Strategas frequently requested chart. Here we go. Yes. All right, Jake. Is so this the challenge? Let about, yeah. Let me, let me first talk about the chart that we've got here. This isn't the uh, challenge though, is it? Nope. We're almost there. All right. I snuck ahead. a few charts in for you this week. This right. one, the chart that we're looking at right here, is evaluating strategist research partners, what they've established is their common man CPI, which is interesting. So they basically looked at the CPI data that the BLS tracks. Hold on, define CPI for our audience, Corey. What is CPI? Consumer price index, which is which a way is also, that... Go ahead. It's also what, basically in English? Inflation. Okay, go ahead. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics measures all different price points for all different goods and has ultimately a CPI number. But Strategist Research Partners, what they did here is they stripped a few things out of that down basically to the essentials that virtually anyone is going to pay for, which they've defined as food, shelter, clothing, utilities, and insurance. So those items specifically. And as you can see from this chart- Energy is in this too, right? On this chart? So food, energy, shelter? Energy. I overlooked energy. Yep. Thank you. So if we look going back to 2018 with this all being indexed to zero, we can see what wages have looked like, what CPI, and then ultimately what- has been defined as the common man CPI for some of these essential services. And the reason I wanted to talk about this today, Jake, is I wanted to get your opinion on this because I have conversations with clients all the time that question the validity of CPI data, the consumer price index. And my view is that the CPI and the cost of living are not the same thing. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, but before I give you my opinion, are you suggesting that, is this chart saying that the common man's inflation has gone up faster than their wages. Is that what this is yes. saying? Yes. Okay. I, I can kind of see, again, you know, I'm not a chart guy, Corey, but I, I kind of see it. I just think that I think it's deeper than this even. I think, and I think I've talked about this on the show before, is that everybody has a personal inflation number, right? Because what you, you know, you and I live close to each other, but let's say that you lived in Belton or Liberty, right? Your gasoline monthly costs would be much higher than mine, who I live, you know, I don't know, a few miles from the office. So your personal inflation number is important. I I appreciate Strategus trying to analyze this, but I still think there's a flaw in this chart because everybody has a different inflation number. 
And I think all of us, me included, can always cut, and we can always trim some fat on our spending. So if, if a client came to me and said, man, Jake, I, I'm just, things are really tight right now. I would highly encourage them to meet with one of our financial planners and go through a budgeting exercise and just get, bring some awareness to how much are you spending? Are you spending $200 on groceries every week and $200 going out to dinner every week and then throwing away half your groceries? Like, right? So, so for example, they may think they're spending $400 a week on food and they can really cut that down to 300 or 200 if they just change their behavior. So I think behavior influences this number also. So, eh, I, I, I get the awareness, Strategus, good try, <laughs> but I still think everybody has a personal number. What do you think? See, my takeaway is not the same. My takeaway is that everybody's personal inflation rate is going to be individualistic. I agree with you there, but I also think the bigger point here is that there's a lot of data. If we talk about inflation coming down, there's a lot of data included in that. But what this is demonstrating is that inflation for these essentials that is going to be included in everyone's personal inflation rate because mm. virtually everyone's going to pay for these things. The inflation rate there has been higher as opposed to, you know, if the cost of electronics or goods or whatever it might be goes down. Like if, if my utility costs have doubled in the, next, in the last 12 months, let's just make up an example here, is, that means my personal inflation rate is higher. But I suppose my behavior would mean that I could, I don't know, keep it cooler in the house. I'm just making up an example here. But like that's my perspective when I look at this because there's been so much coverage around unemployment, economic numbers, et cetera. But despite all of that, the current administration, President Biden and his administration haven't polled very well. Uh, and that's really what they were kind of trying to solve for is like how could both of these things be true at the same time? And I think the argument here was that some of the essentials have continued to, you know, they just moved higher in price. And we all recognize and understand that. But when those are the things that virtually everybody has to pay for, that's why people have the view on the economy that they do. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It's just I thought right. it was interesting because I have p people that ask questions about, is inflation coming down? What do those CPI numbers look like because of my homeowner's insurance or utilities or whatever it might be? Right. And let's remember this, though. So inflation was at 9% and now it's around 3 or whatever. That's still higher than 2 So even though Correct. it slowed, it doesn't mean things are getting cheaper they're just not getting more expensive more quickly. quicker like they were or, or higher yep. or higher prices aren't as steep. So anyways, I get it. All right, good. We're, we're running out of time though, here. Jake, real, I'm sorry, real quick though, just despite all of that, I think the good news here is that uh, we are very much alignment. We are in alignment and that the best thing that you can do though is evaluate where your money is going yes. and what you do have control over regardless of any of this. Yes, yes. All right, good, Corey. We got time for two more here. Hopefully your chart will squeeze in here on my challenge. But go ahead. Let's, we'll get it let's in. The next one. Uh, all right, Jake. So tips to avoid falling prey to online scammers. Yeah, so big problem, right? Corey, I didn't know if you knew this. In the U.S. last year, according to this article, $10 billion was scammed off people. Wow. $10 billion. That's what the B, Corey. So there's some things that you can do. Typically, these scammers, Corey, they're calling you, they're emailing you, they're texting you and they're creating some sort of level of urgency or panic, step one is to breathe, like we kind of talk about here. Slow down, take a deep breath, say, what is really going on? Investment scams are some of the most common. So again, if somebody's trying to pitch you an investment or double or triple your money, be wary of that. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And then lastly here, Corey, if you do get become victim of a scam, file a police report. Let all your banks and credit card companies know. Let us know at Falcon Wealth Advisors. We can do some things to lock down your accounts. Don't be embarrassed. If it happens, it happens, right? A lot of people are, are getting scammed. I certainly don't want to hear about it from anybody. But if you do, you got to let your professionals know, your banks know, so that they can help lock down your accounts and you don't become a bigger victim in that. So $10 billion though, Corey, that's a lot of money. It's crazy. That is a lot of money. So any thoughts on that before we move on to the last topic here? I think you shared some helpful tips, Jake. I think one other quick item that I would add to that that is relevant in the world today is when people are searching, if people are searching you know, on Google or Internet Explorer, whatever browser they might use, they're searching for somewhere that they log into. Just from a pure security standpoint, you literally save like bookmarks on your computer. So you're going directly to a specific website and you're not, going, you're not searching for something that could lead you in another direction. Uh, that is another way that people can just be uh, diligent about making sure that they're not giving the wrong information to the wrong people. Right. All right, good. All right, Corey, let's wrap it up. Here's our last one. Here it is. Thanks for tuning in for the entire episode. Corey, chart challenge from last week. 
Why are more retirees returning to work? If you guys remember, a quick recap is, Corey, you said something to the fact that more people are returning to work. And my question was, is it because they need the money or are they bored? Is that right? You got it. That's exactly right. And the number one reason was inflation and the increased cost of living. <laughs> it goes your inflation which point was, again. Which was 61%. Now, for what it's worth, this actually, Jake, this, this chart and this data is the specific information in the specific survey that was highlighted in the article that we talked about last week. So I went back to check out that study. And it, for what it's worth, it was a survey of 500 people, ages 62 to 85. So I think we need to be cautious about drawing any major conclusions, yeah. uh, given there was only 500 people surveyed. But it was about uh, you know, two thirds, give or take, a little bit less than two thirds of people that are returning, returning to work is because of inflation and increased cost of living. Yeah, then you also got on here, they did not save enough money for retirement. Also to help pay off debt and, and to combat, combat boredom. boredom. But number one was that they're, they're pointing their finger at inflation. All right. Well, I think though, Corey, and again, he's only 500 people. Uh, inflation is an easy scapegoat, right? Maybe people don't want to admit that they have overspent. Or maybe they don't want to admit that they didn't save enough. So saying, oh, inflation is an easy, because everybody knows inflation has been high. That's an easy excuse for me to go back to work, which is fine. Again, if that's how people need to make sense of what they're doing, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. I'm just saying that, again, the data might be flawed in your chart. That's why I don't love charts. It's a survey. Anybody could answer it <laughs> however they want. That's right. That's right. All right, very good. Any other final takeaways or calls to action today, Corey? Make sure you're subscribed to the show and make sure you're following along with Retiring Right for when Jake's book comes out. And for anybody watching or listening, please, if there are if there is a topic, a subject, or an article, Jake mentioned this earlier in the show, but that, that you'd like us to discuss, make sure you send it to Luke at falconwealthadvisors.com. And that way we'll include it because we ultimately aim to make sure that this is useful for everybody who's watching and listening. So if there's something for us to talk about, let's talk about it. Perfect. You? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Corey. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's well said. So we'll wrap it up there. Thank you all for tuning in and we hope you have a great week. Thank you for listening to Upticks. Click the subscribe button to be notified when new episodes become available. Also, be sure to visit our website, falconwealthadvisors.com and click the contact us button if you'd like to meet with Jake and his team.